Good afternoon to all our delegates who have joined the DJA Aviation webinar focused on the right approach to aviation insurance. My name is Neil Piper, the head of content for Messi Frankfurt South Africa, who operate and manage Aero South Africa, and I will be your host today. The speakers today are Lance Williams, Jackie Nivot, Werner Kruger, Graham Spelling, Carol Kirsten. Welcome to you all. The agenda for today, ladies and gentlemen, is um, the short welcome and introduction. Then we go into the various speaker sessions. We'll start with Lance, then to Jackie, Werner, Graham, who's always entertaining, Carol Kirstein, and then we'll end with Graham. Um, and then he will also manage the Q&A session. Please send us through your questions on the chat box. And we will try and get to most of the questions. If we cannot get through all the questions today, and we will then get back to you on those questions on the Aero um, platform on the website. You can go there and we'll um, try and answer all your questions. Um, so just a quick one, Lance Williams, Jackie Nevo, Werner Kruger, these are your, your panelists for today, Graham and Carol. And um, first up to, to talk to you today is Lance. And it really gives me great pleasure to introduce him as a speaker today. He's the CEO of the R Capital Group and is responsible for the overall day-to-day -day operations of the entire group, a holding company principally for short-term insurance intermediary companies. He is one of the original founders of R Capital and serves as a director of all the various groups subsidiary companies. Lance, great to have you today. Over to you. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, thanks very much for that warm introduction. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us on, on the webinar today. And it really is good to have you with us all. Um, as you know, this is the third in the series of seminars of Aero South Africa. Unfortunately, due to COVID and this unprecedented times we are in, uh, the real event was canceled. But this, we really are, are proud and, and honored to be with you today um, and have partnered with Aero SA um, to talk to you about aviation insurance. As Neil said, I'm the CEO of the iCapital Group of Companies and a director of DJA. Uh, we, we've, Neil's shown you the agenda, so um, the, we'll, we hope to really uh, give you deep insight into the aviation insurance market today um, and what's happening in the marketplace. Um, and most importantly, to give you insight into the right approach, approach to aviation insurance. Uh, just an introduction to, to DJ Aviation. Um, we were formed originally in 1969, but only in 1976 did we decide to focus on aviation insurance. Um, this was before my time, but, but certainly some of my colleagues were involved. And today, be proud to say that DJA is South Africa's largest dedicated aviation insurance broker. Um, and we like to think also on the, on the African continent. Uh, we have a team of highly experienced aviation insurance specialists, and we believe the greatest concentration of aviation insurance knowledge uh, available in South Africa and indeed in the African continent. Um, so we, we look after aviation insurance for all our customers um, and look to balance the cost coverage service and security for all our customers in, in, in the best manner possible. possible. Um, also importantly, we have ex excellent relationships with the underwriters that specialize in aviation insurance, both in South Africa and globally. And with aviation insurance markets hardening as, as we've all seen over the last year or so, we believe these relationships these special relationships that we believe we have are of utmost importance in this, in this hardening cycle um, to ensure that we give you the best coverage, best cost and best security for your aviation insurance needs. As Neil mentioned, DJA is part of the iCapital group of companies. iCapital is a short-term insurance intermediary holding company. Um, and we also hold stakes in DJA's sister companies, which are Lionel Isaacs Insurance Brokers and o Associated Insurance Brokers, both located in Waverley in, Je in Johannesburg. 
Um, just a brief introduction to today's speakers. Um, we joined today by my fellow directors, Graham Speller, Carol Kirstein, and Jackie Newbold, and DJ's well-known and popular new business broker, Werner Kruger. I now hand back to you, Neil, to introduce in detail the next speaker and topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lance. That, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, um, I would like to now introduce Jackie Nibbert. Jackie has 24 years of insurance experience, of which 21 years are in the aviation industry. Jackie joined DJA Aviation in 1999 and was appointed to the board of directors in 2010. Jackie currently heads up the new business development within DJA. Over to you, Jackie, and welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining in today and for giving me the opportunity to discuss the current market conditions and what impact COVID has had on the market. In preparing this presentation, I realized that the topic is quite a heated discussion to have since insurance is generally not the favorite topic. But nevertheless, insurance is a reality and we're all, all faced with the same questions. I'm not going to bore you with various statistical graphs, but would like to be more to the point as to where this has started and what we should all prepare ourselves for in the months to come. I have three topics for discussion today, which I'll go into detail as we go along. The first will be how COVID has affected aviation insurance. Secondly, how do insurers assess their premium increases? And thirdly, just a quick on six important aspects to consider when evaluating your insurance renewal. So how has COVID um, affected aviation insurance? Well, the, the economic instability brought on by COVID has affected aviation uh, aircraft owners um, and operators everywhere. With the start of lockdown, there was a drastic drop in activity in the aviation industry not just from a flying activity, but also in respect of new purchases and general insurance inquiries. The direct effects of this have been that charter operators have had to ground their fleet and private aircraft owners had to put flying on hold for a while. COVID-19 has no doubt put huge pressure on the industry, but the question we all have is how do these financial conditions impact on the already tight aviation insurance market? And this question made me stop for a moment because um, the reality is that the insurance market was already struggling with profitability prior to the COVID-19 due to the increase of claims both in quantity and in value leading up to 2018. Up until in the beginning of 2018, the aviation market had been in a soft, a soft market preceding 10 to 15 years, which saw rates reduce year on year and at worst remain unchanged. And this was in spite of the cost of claims. We are entering the third year of insurance market adjusting the rates and um, claims prior to COVID-19. What is very clear is that the global aviation insurance market as a whole is facing unprecedented losses and an urgent requirement from insurers to balance their books had to be made in order to respond to claims. As a result, we are seeing general increases uh, um, across all sections of insurance in the insurance market, regardless of the circumstances. The effects of COVID, in my opinion, will affect the market in so, so much more in the months to come. So how do insurers assess their premium increases? In general terms, insurers assess these premium re, their premium requirements by reference of three principles. The first would be the general market conditions and the underwriting results, exposure relating to a specific risk, and thirdly, the loss record for a specific account. The general market conditions are such that aviation insurance rates are seeing increases at present. This is as a result of losses incurred by insurers over the past several years. And in addition, the effects of COVID-19 with event cancellation and, and liability claims these increases are definitely here to stay. Whilst it is generally accepted that aviation insurers prior to 2018 had been making losses for the last 45 years, these losses were often masked by profits made in other classes. 2017, we saw an unprecedented levels of losses in markets as a consequence of multiple earthquakes and hurricanes, bushfires all around the world. 
And then in 2018, there was a dr dramatic reduction in insurance capacity as insurers moved swiftly to correct loss making areas of their business. And these areas inevitably included aviation. Towards the, the end of the second quarter of 2019, the aviation insurance market started in applying increases. And the increases were very much dependent on the risk and what the expiring terms were. The effects of these losses has also forced insurers uh, or certain insurers to either withdraw from the aviation class, sell the aviation book or merge with insurers. And the effects of this is that the markets are getting smaller and we are dealing with less players who are willing to take on risk. I've been in aviation for 21, 24 years. And over the, this period, we have generally been successful in obtaining 100% support on a, from a single insurer. However, we are now finding that insurers are no longer taking 100% orders. Instead, they are reducing their line sizes, regardless of how good a risk might be. And we are being, uh, that they're also being quite selective in what they would like to write. This in itself is putting huge strain on the entire industry from brokers, owners, operators, since the renewals are taking much longer to get done. And in many cases where possible, we, are, um, we have to extend the policies to the maximum period to find support. And you can imagine these circumstances put huge stress on an operator where they have existing contracts in place and simply cannot afford to go without insurance. What we have seen is that those clients who have enjoyed the very low rates would hit the hardest. These increases can vary from 30 to 100%. And in some cases, which I have come across even more. These are just some of the aspects that contribute to the current state of the market. And whilst we, are, we were hopeful that things would stabilize towards the end of 2020, we are uncertain at this point as the current, current COVID-19 losses have hit the insurance industry really hard. In an article I read recently from the Insurer Insider, Lloyds has estimated 2020 underwriting losses for the reinsurance industry at 107 billion which the Lloyd's market is set to absorb between three and 4.3 billion of the total. In this article, they stated that the industry losses estimates to give weight to the market concerns that COVID-19 could represent the largest ever underwriting losses. And although it's still a, there's still a significant uncertainty about the pandemic or how the pandemic will play out. So before I end, we may all ask, so what, what do we do and how do we prepare for, for what's lying ahead? And whilst we all wish we had a crystal ball and could see into the future, um, the reality is we don't. All we can do is deal with what we do know and prepare for the months to come. With this, I'll list a few things that you as aircraft owners, operators or key players should do and prepare for when evaluating your insurance renewal with the broker in the months or years to come. Firstly, start your renewal process well in advance. Work with your broker well in advance of your renewal. This will give a broker enough time to discuss and negotiate around required coverage, deductibles and conditions with all available markets. These discussions will ultimately have a bearing on how much premium you will end up paying. Secondly, update in, updated information is of utmost importance. It's clear that the aviation insurance costs are going to continue to increase for the foreseeable future. We as insurance brokers do not set the rate or premium. This will be determined by the insurer based on the information provided to them. It is your broker's responsibility to present the risk in such a way that the insurer has a clear understanding of what they are insuring and what their risk exposures is. Your insurance broker can only work with information that is provided to them. Thirdly, evaluate your operation, uses and pilots. Make sure that the cover that you have is what you need. Gone are the days where you could have pilots and uses as required by the insured or wide geographical limits and uses which are not really required. Insurers rate the risk very much on the basis of how it's presented and it's for this reason that it's vital that you update your information with your broker on a regular basis or at least on each renewal. 
Insurers unpack the risk and they do tend to look at each risk on an individual basis. Uses which are seen as higher risk or pilots who are less experienced, they will rate the risk accordingly. So if you do not provide your broker with an updated risk information, you are putting yourself at a disadvantage of potentially being rated higher. Fourthly, cutting cover for price is never a good idea. Insuring with inferior markets could potentially cripple your business. When insuring um, insurance cost goes up, insureds tend to look for cheaper insurance. And we encourage you as policyholder to read your policy, focusing on policy declarations, conditions and exclusions when comparing your quotation, but also looking closely at who your insurers are and what their financial string, strengths and capability, claims, payment capabilities are. Graham Will in his presentation talk about markets and what to consider when choosing um, who to insure with, but um, so I won't be going into that detail. Fifth, the fifth point is um, be prepared to be proactive and involved throughout the process. You may need to answer more in-depth questions, which the broker will need when discussing your policy with new and current markets. And then lastly, do not continuously year on year jump from one broker to the next. We strongly discourage jumping from one broker or insurer to the next, especially if you have worked with a broker for a long period of time. In most cases, moving brokers means you're moving from one insurer to the next, which means that you are not building a relationship with the insurer. In my experience, I know a known history with a particular insurer is helpful in a renewal process and in the unfortunate events of a claim. I realize that cost has a huge impact on the business and sometimes you absolutely have to shop around. But the point I'm making is that you must ensure that you have all the facts that when you make that move, that you don't just look at the numbers. I'll leave you with this final thought. Be open and honest with your insurance broker at all times. Proactive communications is essential to negotiating the best terms and conditions for your risk. I hope that you have found valuable insight into the current aviation insurance market and that you will have a better understanding now of the current market conditions and how you can start planning ahead. Thank you for your time. Jackie, that was very insightful. Thank you very much for that. Thank and you. You managed to stay on time, which is quite a good thing. And <laughs> to all the 100 participants on the call, I hope you enjoyed that session with, with Jackie. Next up, we have Badna Kruger. Um, and um, Badna, let me just change over here quickly. Yeah, Vanna has always had a passion for aviation and received his PPL in 2007, and he's currently busy with his renewal. He started working in the insurance industry in 2011 and joined the DJA team as a new business broker in 2017. He's also currently enrolled in the CAASA Protégé Development Program, and he's a good guy, and um, we're very happy to have him on the call today. So, Vadna, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, in my time since I've started with DJA, um, I've noticed that there is a fair bit of disconnection between aircraft owners, pilots, and um, understanding how the insurance process works and what they are allowed to do and not allowed to do when you compare air law versus insurance. So if we go to the next slide there, one of the things that's currently hot on everyone's uh, minds and the tips of their tongues is the whole issue that we're having with the delays from the CAA in receiving the ATFs or certificates of airworthiness back from the CAA. So we often get the question, can I fly without it on board? To which the only reply that we can actually give to the clients is to check what the civil aviation regulation says. So if we look at part 91, it says the duty of the PIC regarding flight preparation is that the PIC of an aircraft shall not commence a flight unless he or she is satisfied that, regulation number G, all the documents and forms required to be carried on board are carried as specified in regulation 91.03.1. So if we go down to subpart three, 
it says that documents to be carried on board is the owner or operator of an aircraft shall ensure that the following documents or certified three copies thereof are carried on board the aircraft on each individual flight. They further go then and divide them into international flights and domestic flights. And as we see that uh, the certificate of airworthiness is required on international flights and for non-type certified aircraft and authority to fly. And it's exactly the same thing for regulation B for any domestic flight, the certificate of airworthiness is definitely required. They don't specify for non-type certified aircraft, uh, but I believe that it's also definitely um, required on board each and every flight. So even though clients want to fly, and I know a lot of people are losing money by not being able to fly, um, we see that it's definitely a regulation from the CIA. And one thing that we would like to bring across to our clients is that it's not necessarily your broker or the insurer that decline the clients the, the right to fly. It's because it's a law. The insurers cannot override the law and you, neither can your brokers. So unfortunately, the only advice that we are allowed to or can give to our clients is that it is definitely required that you need to carry it on board. And the only other recourse that we can uh, uh, um, advise our clients to get is to ask the CIA if they can send you something in writing that they are allowed to fly without those documents on board. You can go to the next slide. Another one, another issue that I uh, have been working on lately is the unlicensed landing ground suitability clause. This is an exclusion on all of our local policies where it's excluded that if we read it, it says whilst the aircraft is landing or taking off or attempting to do so either at or from a place which does not comply with the recommendations laid out by the manufacturer of the aircraft or at an unlicensed landing ground at night, unless it's due to force majeure. What this basically means is it's, it's very applicable to our clients that fly to private strips, dirt strips, uh, gravel strips, grass strips. Um, you are not allowed to land there at night. So in this recent case that we've had is we have a client and he went and installed uh, landing lights on his dirt strip on his farm. So he contacted us and uh, asked us to discuss the clause. And we then approached the insurer to say that the client has actually installed the lighting in his field. So the insurer was willing to accept that, uh, but the best that we could do is to advise the client that we can extend the period of daylight from 15 minutes before sunset, uh, after sunset and 15 minutes before sunrise by about half an hour to 45 minutes maximum. Um, and the client was still unhappy with that, which is understandable. He has a night rating, he installed the lights, so he spent a lot of money. So what we did is we approached the, uh, the regulations again, where it states that where the adequate aerodrome means an aerodrome license in terms of part 139, or is found to be equivalent to the safety requirements prescribed in part 139, and which meets the requirements in terms of regulation 91075 for the type of aircraft operating here. So what, the, uh, what I find is that a lot of pilots don't actually know that there's also regulations regarding their aerodromes under part 139. And this specific clause relates to flights by night. Part 139.01.5 says that the director may prohibit flights by night from or at any aerodrome or at any heliport at which adequate facilities for night flights are lacking or where the terrain or the other objects in the vicinity of the aerodrome or the heliport are such as to endanger operators of the aircraft used in night flights. So I was able to arrange with the insurer and they've accepted it. And we asked the client if he can approach the CIA and if he can get their approval, then the insurers are willing to cover it. 
So even though there are exclusions in policies, um, it is negotiable. And if the regulator, the CAA, are, uh, um, are willing to accept it, then we can probably try and get it agreed by your insurers as well. Okay, next clause. Thanks, Neil. Another common question that we have is regarding training and instruction. Um, clients often ask, we have an instructor on a policy, can he do training for anyone? And another one is, why does the rate need to increase if the instructor is the PIC? And to which we always have to reply that insurance and air law and, and the way that aviation is regulated doesn't necessarily connect exactly with the insurance. So risks always have to be rated on the lowest time pilot at the controls, not the PIC, which would be the instructor on board. And the reason for that is even though the instructor might be well experienced, the biggest risk behind the controls would be the student. And the underwriters might want to charge an additional premium for that as well. So student or pilots under instruction always have to be named on the policy as well, or they need to comply with the open pilot warranty. Can go to the next slide. Some other questions that we often get from pilots is also regarding safety pilots. Clients often want to know what are the insurer's requirements in terms of safety pilots. When our answer to them is that it's not really a requirement from the insurer's side, it's more a requirement in terms of what's uh, written in the legislation, where if we look at the uh, definition of a safety pilot, um, in terms of part 61 and 91, means a pilot whose sole purpose during flight time is to maintain a visual lookout for threats to an aircraft during simulated instrument flight or to monitor the aircraft's engine and navigation instruments to ensure that exceedances do not occur. And funnily enough, another issue that we have is the pilots also ask us um, regarding their logging of their safety pilot time. So we would also like to point them to the regulations where it's stipulated. Um, it's not really something that the insurer or your broker can provide to you. We can go to the next slide. Thanks, Neil. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. And if we go to part 91, there's also more information regarding uh, your instrument flight time, how it should be logged, and what the requirements are. Again, I would like to stipulate that it's not something from the insurer side or the broker side. We can only advise clients to follow the law. We can go to the next slide, thank you. When we get to insurer warranties is where I also think that some of our clients might, uh, might confuse what is meant from the insurer side between insurer warranties and safety pilots. For example, if clients uh, or if an insurer imposes a warranty on a policy, they might say that a pilot, a low time pilot on a specific aircraft has to fly an a certain amount of dual hours um, with an instructor or a safety pilot. This is just so somebody else is on board to try and uh, mitigate any of the risk whilst the client is still building experience in that particular aircraft. Um, insurers can also uh, um, impose warranties in terms of certain runways that's included or, uh, or fields that's included or excluded. For example, an insurer might say that you're not allowed to fly to any dirt strips, any grass strips, or any unlicensed airfields, or you, there might be no solo flights allowed on that specific aircraft. Thank you, Neil. Can we go to the next slide? In summary, what we would like to bring across to our clients is that in insurance, the legal test is, you have to ask yourself is, if it's legal, it can be covered. If it's not legal, it cannot be covered, regardless of whether or not it affects the safety and or any of the other risk factors. And basically, insurers cannot override or waive any CAA regulations or law. Thank you, Neil. Edna? Yes. 
<laughs> it was really good talking listening to you now. And um, not one person dropped off while you were talking. So you obviously did something right. <laughs> well <Yeah>. done. <laughs> On that note, um, I'd like to now introduce um, Graham Speller. Um, he's a director for DJ Aviation. And he started his career as an aviation insurance broker in London, where he worked in the Lloyds market for Willis Faber and Dumas Limited. He immigrated to South Africa in 1976. That's not showing his age at all. And he joined DJA in 1980. He's got 48 years experience in the aviation insurance market. And he specializes in complex accounts and technical aspects, including training. So with all of that experience, we're very, very excited to have you on the call today, Graham. So over to you. I'm going to stop sharing and you can share your screen. Thanks very much, Neil. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's uh, quite interesting to see some uh, names of friends and, uh, and, and colleagues from all over the world appearing on the, uh, on the chat and asking all the difficult questions, of course, which uh, we'll look forward to uh, trying to get through later on for you. Um, so the, the subject of my uh, discussion is, is something that um, we feel very strongly about. And excuse me, let me just uh, get that sorted. Okay. Um, and that is the question of insurer security. Um, there are often misconceptions that we, uh, we see in the uh, aviation industry, not the aviation insurance industry, where if, if one was to ask the average aircraft owner, um, who are you insured with? they will usually mention the name of a broker. And when you say yes, but who are you actually insured with? Um, they'll say the name of the broker again. And at the same time, the eyes start to go like slits and they look at you and start to back off as if um, you know, there's something seriously wrong. And I think what, um, what we all need to understand is that your insurance contract is with the insurer, not with your broker. Your broker is there to represent you in negotiating with the insurer, but your security starts and ends with the insurer who is standing behind your policy. Now, in South Africa, in particular, um, we have aviation insurance market capacity that is provided um, in, in, from various quarters, shall we say. There's the domestic market, in other words, the South African insurance market, the Lloyd's market in London, Lloyd's of London. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Lloyd's of London. Lloyd's is considered to be part of the South African market owing to historical connections between South Africa and, and Lloyd's. So it is considered to be a domestic market. Then we have the foreign market. Now, the foreign market could easily be split into three types. There's the foreign market, which is based in London, which is really the center of the world um, aviation insurance industry anyway. You would then get foreign insurers in Europe and then foreign insurers elsewhere. And I'm going to come back to this because this is really the crux of, of what I want to talk about. So in the domestic market, um, we have local insurance companies who underwrite aviation insurance, um, as well as Lloyd's. It's considered to be part of the South African market. The advantages of dealing with a domestic market are, are several. First of all, the insurer is domiciled in South Africa. They are licensed under the short, under the short term insurance act. They hold assets in South Africa to cover their liability to their policyholders. They are easily accessible. Um, if you have a, you know, if you have an argument with a South African insurer, you can usually find them, um, and you can go and kick the door down and start banging the table. And also, there is a certain amount of policyholder protection that is afforded to you under the terms of the Short Term Insurance Act. Now, insurers are different. No two insurers are the same. And in South Africa, local insurers um, are are usually rated from a claims paying ability viewpoint by a firm called Global Credit Ratings. They use a, uh, a scale in order to rate an insurer 
uh, which is known as their domestic South African scale, where the, where, they, where the insurer that they believe is the strongest in the domestic market is rated at AAA automatically, and then others are rated by comparison. In South Africa, the only insurer offering aviation coverage which holds a AAA rating is Suntum, which is, as you will all know, one of the country's largest short-term insurers. Others are guard risk um, and Lloyds who, who write business through an agency known as Natural Aviation. I see Dave Reinkes is on this uh, webinar from, from Holland. Hi, Dave. He is the uh, senior underwriter for Natural Aviation. There's Infinity Insurance Company and Constantia, who underwrite through a underwriting agency known as Asriel Aero Africa. Lloyd's itself doesn't carry a domestic rating from global credit ratings, but its international rating of A plus would place it in the AAA category. So that deals with the domestic market. So why do we need the foreign market as well? Well, very simply, um, and I think it was Jackie who's, who referred earlier to the contraction in the aviation market um, as a result of uh, global losses and, and, and the general downturn. Um, capacity is an issue, and we can often not complete a risk, particularly a complex risk, in the domestic market. And so we have to use the international market as well. Foreign insurers, or should we say, uh, non-domestic insurers um, are rated by firms called Standard & Poor's is the is the principal one as well as AM Best. These are both US uh, based organizations that um, follow insurance companies all over the world. They use it, their own international scales which compare insurers regardless of their domicile. So in other words they would be able, you would be able to get a comparison between an insurer, let's say in the UK, and one in Australia by reference to their, um, their Standard & Poor's rating. A AAA rating on the South African domestic scale is roughly equivalent to double B plus on the Standard & Poor's international scale. And this just gives you a very brief, I'm not going to go through this in any great detail, but this gives you a very rough idea of what the relative scales uh, used by Standard & Poor's and AM Best look like. And I've highlighted the, um, the, the A ratings, which are the ones that uh, most insurance brokers would consider to be their minimum uh, standard uh, for any insurer that they would be offering to their clients. Now, um, claims can take many years to be settled, uh, particularly liability claims where there might have been personal injury, um, where actually claims may not even be submitted for many years after an accident. And your insurer has got to be around to fulfill their obligations under the policy. Standard & Poor's studied the rate of failure of insurers within 10 years of holding a particular rating. And you can see that this demonstrates quite dramatically how the rate of failure climbs when you get out of the A category. So AAA, AA, and even single A, um, the rate of failure is still very, very small. But as soon as you get into the Bs and the Cs, the rate starts to climb quite, quite sharply. Furthermore, the time taken to fail on average also changes quite dramatically. So you'll see that of the insurers that you might expect over a period of 10 years to fail if they were A rated at the beginning of that period, on average, they would take about eight, just over eight years to fail. Whereas B, double B, single B and triple C fail very much more quickly. So in other words, you have much less time to react um, to an insurer who is poorly graded or poorly rated before things can go wrong. So, as I said earlier, the lack of capacity in our domestic market, particularly for high-valued, sophisticated aircraft requiring substantial levels of coverage, um, and also foreign-based insurers writing a global account 
can often, uh, can often um, offer broader coverage and of course, more competitive pricing, especially for complex risks, unusual risk profiles and operations in difficult environments, which as we all know, there are one or two in Africa. So what should your selection, what should the selection criteria be? Well, we would say first, it's a question of domicile. First, London-based insurers offer easier access, oversight by the UK Financial Conduct Authority, a high level of familiarity with South African requirements, no language issues, and so on. European um, insurers or Europe-based insurers often prefer to write non-domestic business through their London-based offices. Most insurers, in, in major insurers in, in Europe have London offices. And then insurers domiciled elsewhere, you, the USA being an exception, can operate in uncertain regulatory environments. Uh, there can be language and cultural barriers as well. And so um, we would say in, in, in order of preference, London followed by Europe, followed by the rest of the world. Then you should look at the financial strength rating that has been applied by Standard & Poor's or AM Best. Our minimum recommended rating would be A minus or B plus respectively. And you should always ensure that your coverage provides for the replacement of any insurer who is downgraded to below the minimum rating. That is if it's downgraded during the currency of your policy. Now, regulatory approval is always required for the use of foreign insurers. We have to make an application to the Financial Services Conduct Authority for authority to place business outside the licensed or domestic market. But unfortunately, the FSCA makes no distinction between rated or unrated for foreign insurers, provided the policyholder has acknowledged that he has no protection under the Short-Term Insurance Act, um, uh, in respect of that part of his, uh, his coverage, and that the insurer concerned has no assets in South Africa, then generally speaking, the Financial Services Conduct Authority will grant permission to go outside the domestic market. Our point is that there is a huge difference um, between different foreign insurers. And as the policy holder, in conjunction with your broker, it is ultimately your responsibility to uh, ensure that you have selected an insurer that is appropriate for your use. What are the warning signs? Well, there's two. Firstly, if your broker asks you to provide a written placing instruction and also provide a hold harmless or indemnity undertaking in return for the use of a particular insurer, this is sometimes in the industry known as the chicken letter, um, you should be extremely cautious and you should ask a lot more questions before you approve the use of that insurer. Secondly, if the insurer is, and, and, and let me just say, you must always ask for a complete disclosure of all the insurers that your broker is putting forward uh, don't just assume that your broker is going to place your coverage in the right market. Ask who the insurers are and furthermore, ask where they are. The insurer's domicile is crucially important. And we often find, and, and there are cases like this right now in our aviation insurance industry, of insurers who are domiciled in obscure, unfamiliar locations. Um, maybe in Russia or in parts of the Russian Federation, in the Caribbean and in Central America. These are favorite areas for the establishment of insurance operations which don't require any capital, don't require any sort of backup um, and can be uh, fertile areas for um, insurance scams. Um, Graham, and, uh, yeah. Mew, um, please can you finish off in the next few minutes? Thank you. Uh, Neil, absolutely. If, um, yes, indeed. Uh, I'm, I have one more minute to go. Remember, the selection and acceptance of an insurer is the policyholder's responsibility and risk. 
that is your responsibility as the policyholder. Insurance brokers in general terms are not responsible for the financial stability or conduct of insurers. Your insurer is often all that will stand between you and financial ruin. So choose carefully. A financial strength rating is a guide. It is not a guarantee. Claims can take many years to develop and become settled, especially in the event of serious injury or death. Also remember, if you have several insurers on your program, any one of those insurers is only responsible for its share of a claim. There is no such thing as joint liability amongst insurers. And the, your insurer may need to be around for 10 or more years to settle claims. Be as sure as you can that they're going to survive that long. And that is it. Um, Neil, you said that I would be entertaining. I don't think it's a very entertaining subject, but I hope that um, all of you who are listening got something out of it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Graham, it, um, so entertaining is relative, um, but for me, um, it's been a good day because I've learned a few things from you, so that's perfect. And then it's really good to hear that your SA accent is so strong after all these years in South Africa. It's good to see it coming through. <laughs> my my dear, dear departed mama would be absolutely horrified to hear you say that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Graham. Thanks for that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Carol Kirstein, our next speaker. She's got 34 years of insurance. Um, experience and she's worked for FMB, First Bowering, and DJA Aviation. 17 years of those have been in the aviation industry. Carol joined DJA Aviation in 2003 as claim manager and she was appointed to the board of directors in 2011. I'm going to share my screen, but welcome, Carol. Um, and um, let me just get the presentation for you. And um, I think we should be good to go. I hope it's this one. Let me just get there. I just need to go quickly and see. There we go. Thank you very much, Neil. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to chat about the life cycle of a claim and the role of assessors. Neil, next slide. Here we go. Please. Thank you. I've identified five main steps to managing a claim. There's the initial notification coming in from the client, the processing of the claim through to the insurer, assessing the claim, the finalization of the claim, and then any legal liability claims. Thank you. Neil? Next slide, please. Um, can you not see? Um, uh, I can now. You just need to go back one. Okay. Uh, there we go. That's it. No? Perfect. Thank you. The initial notification. You can go forward again, Neil. Thank you. And the initial notification may come in from the insured, either telephonically or by email. It may also come in from the Oh, I'm back again. Am I back again? Sorry yes. about that. I've had signal all day and now it disappears. <laughs> Murphy's. It's Murphy's. Yeah. Always like that. It is indeed. I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was me. <laughs> um, so the initial notification may come from the insured or it can either come in from the insurer or an assessor. We operate in such a small industry and we hear about losses from different sources. When the CAA are advised about a loss, they would usually contact an assessor to see who's been appointed, as they may need to liaise with them in future. In some cases, they actually jump in the aeroplane with them and would go to the accident site. If the CAA do not go to that, then they may rely on assistance from the appointed assessor. 
The CAA give the authorization to move or recover an aircraft. They will ask that photographs are taken before the recovery though. The broker's duty is to represent the client and assist in the process. Thank you, Neil. Um, the usual information that I would need to report the loss, um, the first and utmost one is obviously, ha have there been any um, injuries? If you've got DJA Air Rescue in place, then you must contact them directly um, as they may require hands-on information. Um, we need the full aircraft details, contact person's name and the telephone number, when and where the loss occurred, what happened and the purpose of the flight, is there any third party damage? And again, take as many photographs before the aircraft's moved. Thank you. Then we process the claim through to the insurer. The broker would advise the insurer in writing of the loss. Um, I would normally follow up with a phone call just to make sure that they have received the email. The main priority at this stage is to have an assessor appointed. The assessor will contact the insured and or the pilot to discuss what happened. They make the arrangements with the insured for the recovery and depending on the circumstances, see when they can meet to assess the aircraft. The assessor will decide to view the aircraft at the accident site or at the repair facility. The assessor will also send an email to the client detailing what documentation they require to complete their report to insurers. And it's the usual documentation, documentation such as your certificate of registration, your certificate of airworthiness, the MPI report, also the latest, thank you, Neil, the latest um, release to service, the last two pages of the flight folio, and then all the pilot documentation, the license um, showing the ratings and revalidation, the medical certificate. They would also require the last two pages of the pilot's logbook. Um, they'll require a signed statement of the circumstances of the accident. And this can come from either the pilot or if it's a ground incident, whoever was on the ground to, to see what happened. Thank you, Neil. To ensure a smooth process, it is imperative to send all the documentation to the assessor as soon as possible, as it will enable them to complete their report and obtain insurer's agreement. The insured may be asked to arrange for the recovery with the agreement from the assessor whilst awaiting for all the necessary paperwork. Should the insured have some concerns about questions raised by the assessor, please speak to your broker first. Your broker is there to assist you every step of the way. Full cooperation with the assessor will assist in the speedy processing of the claim. Then we get to the assessing the claim. Once the assessor had viewed the aircraft and spoken to the agreed repairer, they wait for the quotation from the repairer and all the necessary paperwork from the insured. The quotation needs to be detailed, enabling the assessor to go through it item by item to recommend the repair or total loss if that's the case. They will then complete their report to insurers. It must be remembered that the wreck cannot be abandoned by the insured. It remains the property of the insured unless the insurer elects to retain it. Betterment will also be taken into consideration and discussed with the client, together with any other amounts such as wear and tear, which would be payable by the client. Betterment only applies to life limited com components, such as your engine propeller or your rotor blades. A constructive total loss is when the aircraft is deemed beyond economical repair. The cost of the repair exceeds the agreed value. Some insurers agree that should the repair costs exceed 75% of the agreed value, then the aircraft may be declared a constructive total loss. An arranged total loss is when an agreement is reached between the insurer and the insured that the aircraft is a total loss regardless of the, re the repair costs. The insurer will go through the report and check that the loss falls within the cover provided by the policy. If they're happy that the claim is valid, then they would check that all premiums have been settled, all outstanding premium must be paid before any claims or settlement will be agreed. Thank you, Neil. During this process, the broker will maintain close contact with the assessor and the repair. If the insured has any questions or queries, the assessor and the broker are there to assist and make the process as painless as possible. When the insurers received all outstanding premium, they would advise the assessor to authorize the repairs. Some repairers require a deposit for the parts, so this would be arranged at this time and would require an interim release form to be signed by the insured. 
Once the repairs have been completed and the repairer has sent the final cost to the assessor, they would report to the insurer to settle the final amount. Again, this would require a signed release form. Should the insured wish to manage the repair themselves, a cash in lieu of repairs may be arranged. The downside of going this route is that the repairer may find hidden damage and you've already signed the final release. Thank you, Neil. If the aircraft is a total loss, insurers would ask the assessor to draw up a release form. If there's an astounding finance or a lien holder, then this would be taken into consideration on the release form. The salvage is usually put out for tender, depending on whether the insured wishes to retain it and offers the amount that the assessor believes is a fair value. Collecting the funds from overseas insurers can sometimes take longer than the usual, um, the usual time period taken for the local insurers. Should the claim be denied for any reason, the insurer would advise the broker first and discuss the matter before issuing a denial letter. This would give the broker a chance to clear up any matters with the insured and try and resolve the problem. Reputable insurers, generally speaking, they want to pay claims. They will usually take any opportunity to sort out issues. Thank you, Neil. Then we get to the legal liability claims. When there are passengers injured in an accident, insurers would normally appoint an assessor, um, an attorney, at the time of the loss to handle that side of the claim. If there's a third party damage, again, insurers would normally appoint an attorney, but they would do that whenever the claim comes in from the third party. In some cases where it's a straightforward recovery from a third party, the appointed assessor would handle the process together with the insured. Depending on how the matter progresses, insurers may still have to pass the matter on to an attorney. The insured must never admit liability to anyone as a result of an accident. Liability claims can go on for a lengthy period, as Graham has said. The, <clears throat> the broker should remain involved until the matter is finalized with ongoing status updates to the insured. Thank you, Neil. And finally, we've got the role of the assessor. An assessor is appointed by the insurer and is expected to act in an impartial manner. They represent the insurer in the claim process, but they're also there along with the broker to assist the insured and guide them through the process. It is the assessor's job to collect all the facts surrounding the loss and report to insurers. They assess the damage to the aircraft together with the repairer and the insured. It is not the assessor's function to comment on coverage. This would usually fall within the ambit of the insurer. The insurer may ask the assessor for their opinion on certain matters to clarify technical issues. However, the decision on whether or not to accept the claim under the policy is the insurer's and not the assessor's. The assessor does not sign off a repair. That would be done by the authorized repair facility and engineer. Assessors may assist if there's a possibility of a subrogation action against the third party. Uh, should there be fatalities or injuries to, party, um, to passengers, then the assessor would collect as much information as possible before the matter would be handed over to an attorney. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Neil. Carol, thank you very much. And well done. You managed to get through quite a bit in a short space of time. I hope everybody enjoyed that. And then just a, a shout out to Dennis Jankelo, the founder of DJA. He's on the webinar with us. He thought he could sneak in without us noticing. Uh, welcome, Dennis. I hope you're enjoying seeing what the team has done today. They're doing a fantastic job. Um, Please just keep the questions coming in on Q&A. We're going to get to the questions now. We're running about five minutes late. Um, bear with us. I think um, we're going to go back to Graham now, who's going to talk to us about what you can expect from your broker and insurer, and then he's going to host the Q&A. So we're almost, then, we're almost there. Just buckle up. Graham's going to take us home. Graham, over to you. Uh, hang on. Where are we? Up to... Okay, sorry Neil, I got a bit confused there for a sec. Let's uh, let me just uh, get this one going. So it's been a it's been a fun afternoon for um, all of us. Um, it's this is the first time we've ever done anything like this. So uh, I think we've all been a little bit nervous. Um, we've all tried to prepare as best we can. 
um, and uh, we've had a lot of fun. So thank you, Neil, and your and your crew for putting it all together. And we look forward to doing this again uh, in the future. So I just want to end um, with a few uh, observations about the question of service and what you as policyholders are entitled to expect and in fact should demand from not only your broker, but also from your insurers. Um, so what is insurance? Well, in the simplest terms, it is nothing more than a promise. It's a promise of future conduct made in return for money. You can't touch it, you can't hold it, you can't weigh it, you can't do anything with it. Um, and it is simply a promise that in the event of a certain thing happening, the insurer undertakes to fulfill the promise that it's made, provided, of course, that the conditions attached to the promise are also fulfilled. Insurance cannot be returned for a refund if it doesn't perform as you expected. By the time a loss occurs, it's too late. So the decisions that you make before the loss are the most crucial ones. And a key aspect of assessing the value of insurance is the service levels that are provided by the insurer. Aviation is a very specialist um, undertaking. It's a very specialist part of, of life. Um, and that specialization also applies in insurance. Um, aviation insurance is not like everything else. It is specialized and it does re require specialist treatment. In addition, you're entitled to expect service levels to be provided by the insurance broker arranging and administering your insurance. Service is one of four key elements of an insurance program, which in our lives, we believe should always be maintained in balance. This is what we refer to as the right approach. Firstly, the coverage has got to suit your requirements in all respects. There is no point in cutting down on your coverage in order to make up for shortfalls elsewhere. The cost, of course cost is important. Jackie was talking about this earlier on and talking about how aviation insurance costs are, have been rising and are continuing to rise. So your premium should be competitive, but beware of buying cheaply to save money. That's rather like stopping a clock to save time. Security, which is what I spent 12 minutes, Neil, um, on earlier on, um, but it is important. The insurers providing the insurance must be financially sound and able to see claims through to their conclusion, which could take many years, as uh, Carol also mentioned. And finally, the insurer and broker must be able to provide appropriate levels of service at all stages in the life cycle of the insurance. So what can you expect from your broker? What should you expect from your broker? First of all, experience in, in the subject, in aviation insurance. Ex experience and expertise. Team strength. You want to know that, uh, you know, if you, <laughs> we, we've all seen the Springboks and more recently the English cricket team, occasionally the openers go out very quickly and it, it, it you then rely on the team strength to get you through. The broker has got to have access to both the domestic and international insurance markets. The broker must be able to give you proper advice on insurers to consider and those to avoid, regardless of any other considerations, such as cheap premiums. Your broker has got to have an understanding of aviation law without necessarily being qualified to provide legal advice. But as uh, Werner was saying earlier, it is vital that your insurance broker knows his way around the regulations and can give you proper advice on uh, you know, what, what to do, what not to do. Your broker has got to be able to manage all aspects of the claim process, including challenging the insurers or the assessors where appropriate. And the broker, like in all classes of insurance, the broker has got to place the policyholders' interests first at all times. And what about the insurers? 
Well, it's pretty much the same, really. They've got to have proven experience in aviation insurance. They've got to have demonstrable expertise, an understanding of local requirements and practice, appropriate financial strength ratings, particularly if they are foreign-based insurers. It's so important. They've got to be accessible. They've got to be flexible. And they've got to demonstrate a willingness as well as an ability to pay claims. And quite often referrals are very powerful when it comes to making this sort of selection. And I think that if, if you um, bear in mind all of these things, um, and if you pay careful attention to what your brokers are advising you to do, not necessarily uh, focusing only on the price, um, and take their advice, and carefully consider the, um, the insurers with whom you are basically putting um, your, your, um, your confidence and relying upon for many years, potentially many years ahead, um, aviation insurance should not be, um, uh, should not have too many demons for you. I hope you've enjoyed our, our presentation this afternoon and uh, we wish you all the very best. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Graham. Are you going to run through a few questions now quickly? Yes, I will, with, with the greatest of pleasure. I've just got to stop that. And let's have a look. Can I ask all the panelists uh, just to put your cameras on now? Um, because you might be answering a question. Thank you very much. Okay, here's, a, here's one question. Can you hear me, Neil? Yes, perfectly. Okay. So here is one question. Um, uh, and Carol, I'm, gonna, I'm going to pass this one to you, um, if I may because it, uh, it relates to claims. The question is, if the assessor doesn't sign off the repair, what happens when the repair facility doesn't do a good job with the repair? What recourse does the policyholder have? Um, thanks for that, Graham. Um, so the assessor is not there to, to sign off any repair. The repairers and the engineers have all been authorized by the CAA. Um, and that's, that's their function. If the work is not done properly, um, the recourse is to the repair facility themselves. And the broker would normally also assist in this process um, and the assessor, everybody does get involved, but it is for the repairer to stand up and to fix whatever they have not done properly. They, have, they must rectify their work and they must do it um, to the standards that are expected of them. And that's why they've been approved by the CAA. I hope that answers the, uh, the question. Let's just see, uh, there's a couple more here. Um, the question um, for Werner. Werner, um, one of the delegates has said, can you, um, explain the difference between uh, having a safety pilot and flying dual. Yes, Graham, sure. So when an insurer imposes a warranty on a specific policy or for, to a specific pilot, that usually means that this pilot might be either a low time total pilot or he might not have sufficient experience on um, the advanced machine that he's flying. So very often they will impose a warranty to say that this specific pilot has to fly a certain amount of dual hours. Normally that would be with an instructor. Um, but in some of the cases that I've dealt with, the insurers were also willing to negotiate that down um, between flying dual with an instructor to flying dual with a safety pilot on board. Um, it would depend, of course, on the complexity of the machine that they're operating. Um, yes, I, I think that's pretty much the difference between them. Thank you, uh, Verna. Um, another one for you, Carol. Um, and this is coming from somebody who I think has got a bit of experience. In <laughs> yeah. we send greetings from Holland. Um, are repairs guaranteed by the insurer? No, repairs are not guaranteed by the insurer. Um, that's, it's not their function. Insurers are there to settle claims. Um, the repairs must be carried out um, correctly by the AMO um, at the time. Um, 
normally what would happen is um, assessors and brokers and or insurers do not tell um, the client where to take the aircraft to be repaired. They would normally leave it to them to go to their usual AMO. Um, and in that, in that way, they're usually familiar and comfortable um, with, you know, with the AMO. So no, the, um, the insurer does not guarantee the, um, the repairs. Well, well answered, difficult question and, and fielded very well. Um, Thank you. So our, last, our last question for this afternoon um, comes from a very good friend of ours um, in Botswana. Uh, good afternoon, Coletzo. Um, who asked, when operating to unmanned runways, are pilots required to overfly the runway before landing, or is this dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis? Now, who should we who should we select? Um, how about how about Verno? Do you want to handle <laughs> that again? You're the you're Thanks, the pilot. Yes, I'll I'll uh, go to that one. I actually did answer Kolekso directly um, in the chat section, but let me explain it to everyone. Um, overflying the runway is normally dictated in by law all the overhead uh, joining procedures for unmanned airfields. Um, so the pilot would have to consult the legislation for his country. It might be a little bit different from country to country, but it basically dictates that you do have to overfly the runway um, at a certain angle before joining for landing. But you would then, of course, make a runway inspection, especially if it was a dirt strip um, where you did not, uh, didn't know beforehand what the uh, state of the runway was. But we always uh, try and advise our clients to do a proper runway inspection, maybe the day before, even if you have a friend or someone in the area, if they can take a couple of pictures or a video to show you exactly what it looks like, keep, uh, uh, keep that with you. Um, but yes, so, so consult your legislation and do the runway inspection. Yeah. Well done. Well, I think, um, I think, Neil, that brings us to the end of our allotted time. There are some other questions that have come through. I would ask um, anyone who has a question that they've posed or one that they've thought about and would like to ask to contact one of, uh, one of our team at any time after this webinar and we'd be only too happy to, um, to assist you and provide the answer to all of your questions. Um, I think, Neil, you're going to hand back to Lance now. So just on behalf of all the speakers, guys, thank you very much indeed. We've, we've, been, we've really enjoyed it. Um, we've all stammered and stuttered a little bit, but um, we got through it. So thank you for your attendance and uh, all the very best. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. To add. Uh, thanks very much. I can just echo that uh, from Graham. Uh, DJ Aviation is very proud to be part of the aviation industry in South Africa and Africa at large and in del delivering the right approach to aviation insurance. Um, so on behalf of Aero South Africa and DJ Aviation, I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us today and, and Dennis to you especially. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's been really great to present to you all. Um, and we wish you all the very best. Thank you. And then just um, from my side to all the speakers, and um, you guys have been absolutely brilliant. I know for some of you, it's the first time that you've done a webinar, um, but it was really good. Um, you can be proud of yourselves. And then just um, uh, the presentation, the recording of the presentation will be on the Aero Marketplace. Um, if from tomorrow, it will be there. Uh, for your perusal. So please head to the Aero Marketplace for that. And then just from my side, thank you very much for all your time. We appreciate it. And um, look out for the next one we host. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.